Hi, I'm Jeff Detoy. I'm from a consulting engineering firm called Zutari. I work in a team that specializes in water and wastewater treatment applications. And I've been asked to talk to you about municipal wastewater treatment. So my presentation overview is as follows. We're going to talk about what the objectives of wastewater treatment are, the composition of municipal wastewater, so basically what's going into it, how do we treat it, so what technologies are currently available, where is the future of wastewater going? And then what is decentralized wastewater treatment, um, which is, I think, what your project is about. So if we were to look at the objectives of wastewater treatment, um, the image that you can see in front of you, uh, you'll probably recognize the shape of it. Um, but you also probably recognize that it's a, almost a fingerprint of all the rivers that flow through South Africa. And if we think about our water, generally in how we use it. We take water out of a river, we consume it somehow, and then we return it to a river, and then it flows down to the next community. And if we were not responsible in looking after the water resources that we have access to, uh, we would end up with very polluted water and very angry communities downstream. And yet that is how we treat our water typically. Um, a huge amount of waste gets dumped in rivers and gets to flow downstream. Um, and this is obviously not a good situation. We want to be a bit more responsible with our water. Um, apart from just the communities downstream, uh, the groundwater table is also impacted by the quality of the water that we discharge, either onto land or into the rivers themselves. And many people are reliant on decent quality water for agriculture and for food production and also for drinking. Uh, so we really do need to look after our water sources. Uh, the water um, will flow through the rivers and eventually will discharge out to sea. Um, and it can be pretty unsightly and unpleasant for, for anyone who receives it. So what is in wastewater? Well, about 99% of it is water, which is not too big a surprise. But there are a whole bunch of other things that are carried in the water. So if you think about your daily activities, there are a whole bunch of things that you introduce to the sewers, whether it's related to the food you consume, um, the clothes you wear, the, your bathroom habits, um, and a whole bunch of things that we consume ultimately get into that water. So if we were to break it down into the various components, the, um, there are a number of major components, water being the largest, but the ones that we're really interested are listed here. So energy is where we're referring to organic molecules. So these are biodegradable or unbiodegradable particles, but ultimately these are things that can be used as food, a carbon source, um, for organisms that are in the water. The reason we're concerned about this is because in order for most bacteria and organisms to access um, those organic molecules, they need, to, they need to combine them with oxygen for synthesis and metabolism for their growth. Um, and if there's a lot of organic material, then any biology that's in the water will consume as much oxygen as it can and effectively deoxygenate the water, making it difficult for other aquatic life to live. Um, and the water can become toxic, so you'll get die off of fish and other things. Similarly, in the water, we can get a lot of nutrients. So we look at macronutrients, which are your nitrogen, phosphorus, which are the fundamental building blocks of, of many organisms, but primarily um, plant matter. So if we have um, concentrations above certain thresholds of nitrogen or phosphorus, it enables a lot of plant matter to grow. Plants typically need sunshine, carbon dioxide, and your macronutrients, and then it can grow. So if any of you have seen images of the Harder Biosquare Dam, you would have seen the incredible amount of hyacinth that covers the lake. Um, the problem with the growth of, of uh, plants is not the plants themselves, but the fact that they cover the water body. And as a result, they also prevent oxygen from getting into the water, which then exacerbates the lack of oxygen in the water. Um, and you do deoxygenate it and you get fish die offs again. Further micronutrients like minerals and salts, the more saline the water becomes, uh, the more problematic it is. And particularly when you've got large communities like Johannesburg discharging into a river, salts are much harder to remove from the water um, and they can have significant impacts on the ability of plants to, um, to use the water. So if it's too saline, plants could use it and it becomes toxic, it damages soils, there are other problems there. Um, there's a lot of inert material that goes down. So you think of your earbuds, tampons, any plastics that go through the, the, um, the water, those need to be removed because we can't dump them in the river. Um, and then the other pollutants that come in, so your pharmaceuticals, pathogens, chemicals, toxins, um, all of these things are dangerous and we should be removing them from the water. Okay, so how do we treat the water? So 
here's a train of a whole bunch of different process steps. We start with pre-treatment, then primary, secondary treatment, solid liquid separation, and tertiary treatment. And I'm going to go through each step one by one. Pretty obvious. Basically, we're trying to remove all the coarse debris and particles from the water. So any sand and grit, gravel, and um, those things we can settle out very readily in a, in a, a grit channel. Um, and further with screenings, we take the water across a screen, various different types of screens sometimes, um, and that's to rem remove basically easy things to remove. Um, if it's a screen, you can take a rake and lift it out. Um, for large applications, we have very complicated mechanical screens, which are constantly cleaning themselves, um, but basically trying to get everything that we can easily remove from the water out up front. Okay. So then we go into primary treatment, and this is now to settle the finer particles. So if you imagine in the sewer system, a lot of what goes down gets broken down to smaller and smaller pieces, but those pieces can still settle. So if they're given a chance in an acquiescent environment, those particles can settle and they can become a settleable sludge, which we can then remove. So that again, fairly intuitive, um, but that's the, the next step that we go through. And the primary treatment typically takes out a lot of the organic carbon or the energy in the water. It's a very effective step. Um, but then what's left is typically the things that don't settle and all of your soluble organics and soluble nutrients. So we're going to take a bit of a diversion here. So some of you may have seen this diagram. Um, it is basically a summary of the family tree of all living organisms. We all effectively have evolved from a single organism um, and just to put this in context, most of what you see in terms of those names are all what we call bacteria or um, archaea. And the terrestrial organisms with which humans form a part are part of that one little sliver, the eukaryota. Um, so pretty much everything that uh, we would consider with um, terrestrial animals, whether it's birds, reptiles, uh, mammals, fish, um, everything comes from the eukaryota. Almost everything else is a very small scale and they're all different types of bacteria. And almost every one of these bacteria are somehow involved in the wastewater treatment process. So bacteria come in huge numbers of forms and they have evolved rapidly. They are all around us. If you were to take scrapings off your skin, you'd find bacteria. They are everywhere. They are in our guts. They are on our skin. They are all around us. Um, and bacteria are very useful in that they have evolved to consume whatever they can to continue their synthesis and metabolism process. So bacteria typically are incredibly diverse and they all have their own specialities. So some of them might be very good at digesting a particular type of organic. Some of them are very good at converting ammonia to nitrate. Some are good at converting nitrate to nitrogen gas. Um, some are slow growing, some are fast growing. Um, and if you can harness the bacteria um, to consume the soluble um, and suspended organics and nutrients in the water, they will grow. They will synthesize the nutrients and the organics that are in the water to create more biomass. That biomass, as it gets larger and more bulkier, is then basically you're able to separate it physically, either through a setting process or through a filtration process. And if you can take that biology out, and you've engineered the system well enough, the biology will consume everything in the water that you don't want anymore, and you are left there with clean water and biomass, which you can separate out. Okay. So this is what our biology looks like in the water, and we call it activated sludge. Basically, it's flocks of biology which are kept in suspension. Um, a very necessary requirement for activated sludge is you need to be able to feed it with a significant amount of oxygen. And this is a very significant amount of oxygen. Um, in the city of Cape Town, about 10% of the energy consumed by the city is consumed in the pump stations that collect wastewater and feed it through to the wastewater treatment works and at the wastewater treatment works uh, where we need to mix the sludge and aerate it. Okay, so the secondary biological treatment step um, is your activated sludge process. We grow biomass, um, we remove the nitrogen, convert it to nitrogen gas. Um, and we fix the phosphorus that's in the water. Um, and it's really a case of understanding the characteristics of the water. When you get to third or fourth year, you'll study wastewater treatment and get an appreciation for how complicated and involved the process can become. But suffice to say, we're creating an environment filled with biology 
and that can take out all the organics and the nutrients that we want from the water. Thereafter, all we have to do is to settle um, the wastewater um, or use membranes to separate it. Um, and then what leaves is then your soluble and biodegradable particles, which are not a problem for the, the rivers they go to. Here's an image of an, aero an, an aerobic reactor in Hermanus. Um, you can see the, um, the mixes here, which are churning the water and pushing oxygen into them. Um, and then here's a secondary setting tank, also at Hermanus. Um, it's a big circular tank, water comes in the middle and it flows to the outside, the sludge settles and the water overflows. Processes, you then have what we call tertiary treatment. Um, and this could be a media filtration, um, or we could use membranes, uh, or we could use lagoons, uh, um, basically just to try and capture the last bits that maybe weren't caught in the secondary um, the treatment process or the solid liquid separation. But after that, we then disinfect the water with a dose of chlorine. Um, so then any viruses and bacteria that might still be in the water are killed, and then it goes and enters the river. Okay, here's an image of lagoons following a, a wastewater treatment works. But then you would have noticed that every one of these processes, we're getting cleaner and cleaner water going through, that we have a waste stream which is generated. And that waste stream is not insignificant. In fact, it does treat it somehow. So typically, uh, we collect the sludge. Uh, we will then thicken it in its own dedicated thickening tank. It may need to be stabilized, which means if there's still a lot of organic carbon in it, uh, we would go through a further treatment process of a concentrated sludge. Um, and that could be an aerobic treatment process or an anaerobic treatment process. We then need to dewater it to take the water out of it. So you put it through one of any number of mechanical processes, but basically you squash the sludge, the water leaves it, and you get a fairly compact um, thick material. Um, and then you might want to try that further, either through solar drying or through heating and ultimately then try and dispose of the solids. And now how we dispose of it is becoming a bigger and bigger question. Here's just an image of an aerobic digester with a thick sludge now, um, and they're trying to get as much of the energy out of it as possible so it becomes stable so they can send it to another process. Uh, these are composting banks where the um, activated sludge or the, the stabilized sludge now, once it's been dewatered, it gets mixed with a bulking agent, typically a municipal green waste, and then it's allowed to compost and ferment over time. Um, and this improves the quality of what's there. And ultimately, you might be able to apply it to land so you can return those nutrients back to land where they can be used productively. Um, land application is fairly common, um, and uh, you must be quite careful applying. You don't want to add too much nutrients to the land, otherwise, it might then become um, toxic to the plants. Um, alternatively, you can send it onto landfall. So that's the basic treatment process. But looking forward, um, where are the trends going? So for, the first thing is that we use a lot of energy and waste water treatment. So there are technologies coming out which are lower energy, so more passive designs. Um, there are also different ways of dewatering which are more efficient. Um, so one of the big ones that we're looking at the moment is thermal hydrolysis. And this is where you take that sludge and you actually heat it up quite a lot. You then allow it to digest and thermophiles, and so these very interesting bugs which operate at very high temperatures, are then able to digest the water and they can produce a huge amount of uh, gas that you can you can burn. So we're talking about methane, large amounts of methane get generated instead of carbon dioxide, and then the methane can be used to generate energy. You can run it through a turbine um, to create energy. Uh, the biology we use is not specialized. Uh, we create environments for activated sludge where whatever bacteria takes hold will work. Um, but there are a lot of initiatives now to try and find specialized cultures of microbes that do very special things. And if we can tailor them correctly, maybe they could be a super bug or a, a super settling uh, bacteria, which might be a, make for a more efficient process. Um, further, can we recover any of the things that are in this wastewater. So it can recover the water, it can recover the nutrients, can recover some of the energy as gas. And I'll touch on that in a moment. Also, the toilets we use are an old technology. It's been around for 150 years. So are there not better ways of using toilets? Um, decentralized systems, as we'll talk about in a moment, urine diversion, which UCT is pioneering through Prof. Randall's um, work um, and various other ways of looking at those differently. 
So for example, on the left is the Organica system, which Marion Roberts is uh, pioneering in South Africa. Um, basically, we're using plants which grow their roots into the um, wastewater activated stuff system. It creates a substrate, um, but also almost naturally aerates it. Um, so you don't need to add as much energy. On the right, we've got a compostable toilet. This is gaining ground in a lot of places. It's not mainstream by any means. Um, but with a correct bulking agent, you can reduce odors, um, and it's a very sustainable way of capturing your own waste and then digesting it and then using it for compost and other things. Um, here is the um, CAMBI process. Uh, this is from the Dublin Wastewater Treatment Works. This is a very advanced technology, but it results in a very useful sludge at the end and gives you the advantage that you could start recovering your nitrate uh, nutrients from it, um, and you could produce a very rich gas from it, um, a methane of sorts. So if you look at the sludge cycle, um, it's a significant part of the process. And what we'd ultimately like to aim for is that we recover the nutrients. So then you can get dedicated composts um, and uh, fertilizers uh, from your wastewater treatment process. You could recover energy from your wastewater treatment process. So rather than putting energy in, you're getting energy out. So it's not only um, energy neutral, but hopefully it's energy positive. So it's putting energy back into the grid um, so that your waste or treatment work starts becoming a battery instead. And the thing that I'm most interested in at the moment is if we're gonna to go to so much effort to treat our wastewater to a fairly high degree, how much further do we have to treat it before we could drink it again safely? And the city of Cape Town is looking at this question quite seriously. Um, and we're designing the, the one of the reuse plants for the city of Cape Town. And this will be a fairly large scale one uh, if and when it gets implemented. Um, so watch that space. Again, okay, so you guys are interested in the decentralized water treatment systems. So what is a decentralized system? Well, fundamentally, um, in our cities, we have big sewer networks which take a lot of wastewater and take it to a centralized waste or treatment plant. It receives a huge amount of water, a massive organic load, and therefore we need a very concentrated um, wastewater treatment process with high energy inputs. But if you had a much smaller catchment and you had space for the treatment process, you could get away with far simpler wastewater treatment processes. So what's illustrated on the left of the screen um, is basically the wastewater would arrive in a separation chamber and you go through a series of chambers where it can settle then once all of the solids are settled out, you then take the soluble material and you flow it through bio biological filters. Effectively, you've created media banks and biology grow on those and they remove the nutrients from the water. And what's left then goes through um, a constructed wetland, um, which is basically a bank of media, and you can put plants into that. And those plants grow, they use the sunlight, they use the nutrients, and you keep harvesting the plants to effectively remove the nutrients from the water. The one big attraction of decentralized water systems is that you can make them quite attractive. Um, so the examples that are shown on the screen are actually both from KZN, um, from various initiatives that have been run to try and look at dewatering systems in South Africa, um, decentralized systems. The reason they're looking at them is that some of our centers are very concentrated, so it's easy to collect all the wastewater, but many centers aren't. Um, so a lot of rural areas, it's difficult to get that wastewater to a dedicated wastewater treatment plant. Um, so why can't they have a decentralized system which is close to them? Also, please don't get trapped into thinking that decentralized wastewater systems have to be rural, third world type of solutions. 85% um, of the wastewater treatment in Japan is decentralized systems. Um, and that's culturally, they've always taken blocks or neighborhoods and they would have their own dedicated wastewater treatment system. The idea being that then you can discharge directly into a sewer or you can discharge into the stormwater system from where you are. So there are not massive sewer systems in Japan because they have a number of these decentralized systems. Okay, the benefits, um, it is low maintenance, a low operational cost. Um, the materials you can use for construction are generally readily available and they're local. Um, also, there is not the same attraction for theft because it's basic materials like bricks, mortar, stone. Um, you could, generate energy from the process. So the first settling steps typically become anaerobic. They generate methane gas. You can harvest that gas and you could cook of it, which is uh, what a lot of um, decentralized systems further up in Africa to Ghana in particular, use these systems a lot to generate biogas and that biogas is used for cooking or other applications. 
Um, there are no major energy inputs, so it's more energy efficient. And um, the water that comes out is of a reasonable quality. Um, it could be used for, for agriculture. I don't fully agree with that point. I think you need to be quite careful in where you use the water, but it is a potential application. So some questions for you. What are the objectives of your decentralized wastewater system? What are the boundaries of the community that you're serving? Um, so uh, how big is that community? Um, once you've got the size of it, then how much wastewater will you generate? And how will it get to your decentralized system? Are you going to create a sewer system, canals? How's the plumbing going to work? Um, then where would you install it? Um, do you have space for it? And if you did, how would you manage that space? How could you conceive it so it could become a useful space and not unattractive and problematic? Um, what is the context of the site you're looking at? Are you in a rural area, an urban area? Uh, those are all things I'm sure you'll get to work through with your, with your prof. Lastly, um, here are a whole bunch of resources of various DWAT, um, DWAT uh, company providers. Um, I'll send this link separately because I'm not sure if you can access it off this video. Um, but please do look them up um, and see if there's anything there that uh, can help you. Okay, so we end with this image. So I hope I've given you some context about the wastewater treatment systems that we have in South Africa and why wastewater is so crucial and treating wastewater is so crucial um, to our South African environment. We are not a water rich nation. So whatever we generate flows down our rivers, it gets concentrated and it will affect any communities downstream. So thank you so much for listening. I hope this presentation has been useful and um, I am sure you don't need to dive into the details of exactly how to design a system, but please think about the broader context. What does it mean to design something? How is it going to affect the people you're at? And I hope it's also inspired you to think a little bit differently about wastewater um, and the resources that it holds that we should be trying to recover. Um, hopefully you guys one day will get to industry and you'll be championing the idea of resource recovery and water recovery. Okay, all the best. Have a great time with your project. Cheers.